we proved the abel lewell formula what does the formula say dny by dx to the n plus sigma j from 0 to n minus 1 ajx djy by dxj we are taking a linear differential equation of nth order with uh, variable coefficients and wx is the ronskian of solutions y1 y2 yn then the ronskian satisfies the uh, the formula wx equal to wx naught x of minus integral x naught to x a n minus 1 t dt. Is this clear to everybody whatever we had done last time? So, let us recall briefly how the proof went. Yes, first you take the Ronskian. What is the what is the Ronskian with the determinant right? y 1 y 2 y n in the first row y 1 prime y 2 prime y n prime in the second row and so on. What is the nth row y n to the n minus 1 etcetera that is your round skin. You differentiate it and then you recall the how, uh, formula for differentiating a determinant right. So, you differentiate the first row keeping the other rows intact that will be one determinant plus the next determinant will be keeping all the rows intact except the second row and you differentiate the second row. So, you will get a sum of n determinants right. Now, if you do it with the Ronskian n minus 1 of them will be 0 and the last one will be simply be y 1 y 2 y n y 1 prime y 2 prime y n prime etcetera except that the last row will be the nth derivative of y n y 1 nth derivative of y 2 etcetera. <laughs> And the nth derivative uh, you should uh, replace it by the sum of the uh, previous derivatives using the OD correct. So, now you get so dw by dx becomes a determinant wherein the last row is the sum of n terms and so the determinant is a sum of n determinants again n minus 1 of them will be 0 only one of them will remain and what remains will be minus a n minus 1 x times the round scale. So, you get d w by d x equal to minus a n minus 1 x w. So, you obtained a first order linear O d e for w you solve it and you integrate it from x naught to x you get the formula w x equal to w x naught x buff minus integral x naught to x a n minus 1 t d t right. This is one of the a very important formula and I also pointed out to you some of the applications to things like fluid dynamics etcetera. Okay, now, we will see one application of this. So, use of a known solution suppose y 1 x is a solution of a second order O d e y double prime plus p x y prime plus q x y equal to 0 and you have a solution y 1 you have a solution y 1 of course, 0 is always a solution, but that is a stupid choice because it is not going to give, give you anything better. So, you assume that you have a non trivial solution then you how uh, the problem is to find a second linearly independent solution. Have you seen this in your courses that you teach use of a known solution? Okay. okay, this is very easy using the abel lewell formula. Here is the result a second linearly independent solution is given by y 2 of x equal to please write this down y 2 of x equal to y 1 of x integral 1 over y 1 squared x of minus integral p d. How does the proof go? Proof is simple. Now, I am going to assume whatever be the second solution I can assume that the Ronskian uh, at the origin uh, at x naught is 1 right. So, take a second solution y 2 if the Ronskian of y 1 and y 2 is 1 at x naught well and good otherwise replace y 1 by a multiple of y 1 right because it is a homogeneous linear second order O d. Right? 
correct. So, if uh, y is a solution, c times y is also a solution, correct. So, by scaling the solution, I there is no loss of generality in assuming that w of x naught is 1, is that correct? So, what does our differential equation become? It simply becomes uh, our abel Liouville formula simply becomes w of x equal to x puff minus integral p dx because your a n minus 1 in this case is exactly p x correct. Also the Ronskian is what? The Ronskian is y 1 y 2 y 1 prime y 2 prime and the Ronskian w of x naught is assumed to be 1. So, it is exactly x of minus integral p dx. So, expand the 2 by 2 determinant you get what y 2 prime y 1 minus y 2 y 1 prime equal to x of minus integral p dx. Right. Now, divide by y 1 this will only work in those intervals where y 1 is not 0. If y 1 is 0 this division is not allowed. So, you assume that y 1 is not 0 and you work in that interval where it is not 0. So, you, what do you get? What is this over, over here? That is a ODE for y 2, a linear first order ODE for y 2, right. What is its integrating factor? What is the integrating factor for this ODE? e to the power minus integral y 1 prime by y 1 correct. So, what is integral of y 1 prime by y 1 log y 1 right and so I have e to the power minus integral y 1 prime by y 1. So, it is what 1 by y 1. So, the integrating factor is 1 by y 1. So, now apply the general solution of a first order O d y 2 by y 1 equal to integral of 1 over y 1 times the right hand side right. So, you get a okay. let us see what is the result of this. Okay. So, the integrating factor is 1 over y 1 and so y 2 equal to y 1 into integral of 1 over y 1 square x of minus integral p d x one more dx will come because there are, this is the this times another dx all right. Is this clear? The derivation of this second linearly independent solution. You if you look at books like Krasik or Boyce de Prima or any of the other books, you will find a slightly different derivation you will find a very different derivation you will uh, the, uh, the derivation will go as follows. It, it will say let us seek y 2 of the form y 2 equal to v y 1 and you will substitute this into the differential equation and get an O d e for v. It will give you the same result, but I have used the abel Liouville formula to derive it. So, let us apply this idea to a very specific example. As usual, we always after every little piece of theory, we will always look at a specific example. So, let us take the Bessel's equation of order half 4 x squared y double prime plus 4 x y prime plus 4 x squared minus 1 y equal to 0. That is a Bessel's equation of order half. One solution is sin x upon root x. Find the second linearly independent solution. Yeah, any questions? One solution is sin x upon root x. We want to find the second linearly independent solution. Okay, so, now what is your p x? Remember, the differential equation is not in normal form. You have to divide by 4 x squared, correct. Then the middle coefficient is what? 1 over x coefficient of y prime is 1 over x. So, p of x is 1 over x. So, x of integral p dx correct. So, now you do 
do that and you get y2 equal to sin x upon root x into x uh, upon sin squared x x of integral minus p dx is again 1 over x the x and the 1 over x cancels out and you get what sin x upon root x integral cosecant squared x how do you get the y1 x that the, the, the method presumes that somehow you know a y1 x we will get back to this question later now so y2 of x turns out to be according to this formula sin x upon root x integral cosecant squared x what is the integral of cosecant squared minus cortex so the second solution is minus cos x upon root x of course it's a linear differential equation so if minus cos x upon root x is a solution cos x upon root x is also a solution so might as well take it take the second one is cos x upon root x okay how do you know that sin x upon root x is a solution one way to do it would be to apply the power series method or the Frobenius series method method of Frobenius series will give you sin x upon root x as a solution. But, the, but this particular technique presumes that you know one solution, then we are trying to find the second linearly independent solution. And by the way on the slide you have an exercise, please jot down this exercise. Minus p x, yes. So, there is a 1 over x na? and so uh, 1 over x integral is log x. So, when you put the minus sign you get e to the power minus log x. So, again it becomes 1 over x, correct. Right. So, pl uh, please jot down the exercise, check that y 1 and y 2 are linearly independent. check that y1 and y2 are linearly independent all right well uh, y y2 is a multiple of y1 right so if 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 they are linearly dependent then the second integral should be a constant that's how you'll get a contradiction any other questions you have so far alpha and beta Ha, so, if you have two things which are linearly dependent, then either one of them has to be identically 0 or the one of them has to be multiple of the other, correct. So, that is what I am saying. So, suppose if y 2 and y 1 were linearly dependent, then they then, then uh, they will have, the y 2 will have to be a multiple of y 1. I am assuming that y 1 is not 0, correct. And so, that integral of 1 over y 1 squared is the exponential that will be constant which is not which is not the case because 1 over y 1 squared exponential is not 0 is not the 0 function here are some problems for you have fun I must see it, otherwise it will not come in the screen. Not coming? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there it is. There it is. They were kind to you. They were giving you a few extra seconds before your, you know, joy, you know, drops down. <laughs> There are five exercises. In each case, you are given a one solution. You are given one solution. You are asked to find the second linearly independent solution. So, quite a interesting bunch of exercise exercises. And uh, okay, in some of them, you see you may not be able to carry out the integration, the final step 
you may just have to leave it in as an integral. It may not, it may not, you may not be able to work out the integral, it may not be, the indefinite integral may not be computable. You leave it as an integral, that is it, finished. Y2 equal to Y1 times integral, the integral can be computed, go ahead and compute it, otherwise just leave it. That can happen in some of these exercises. I think it does happen in one of the, one of them at least. I don't know. For the very first one? Well, no, I think it, uh, it, it, the, uh, it happens for others also. Sir. No, it, that, that, that's not going to give you any clue. Y1 of x is e to the power x squared is not going to tell you that the second one is going to. Yeah, yeah, it could, it, yeah, it could be uh, computable. Okay. And here some more. The Chebyshev's equation appears here. 1 minus x squared y double prime minus x y prime plus 9 y equal to 0, p equal to 3. Remember I gave you a list of equations of mathematical physics, the Legendre equation, the Bessel's equation, the Chebyshev's equation, the Logger equation, hypergeometric equation, yeah. Chebyshev's equation appears here. And there are some exercises on checking whether some functions are linearly independent or linearly dependent. So, you can think of item number 7, 8 and 9 as exercises in linear algebra as well, if you like. You can think of it as exercises in differential equations or you can think of it as exercises in linear algebra, because there are also you are studying linear independence and linear dependence, right. How far have you come in the linear algebra course? Okay, so you're quite okay. So you're you're well past abstract vector spaces. So now we can. So these questions are well in place. Okay. So this uh, compute the Ronskian of e to the power m one x e to the power m two x e to the power m k x, where m one m two m k are distinct. After computing the Ronsky and you should also conclude that they are linearly independent. Conclude that the functions are linearly independent because the Ronsky will not be 0, right. So, you should be able to do that. And the next exercise is also important. Exercise 7, 8 and 9 are important. They are important exercises from the point of view of differential equations, right. We shall refer to them later. Linear independence had to be checked. The very fact that they are solutions of a linear OD is a different is a different story. For example, item number 9, I mean it is not clear, right, which OD is it a, a linear independence should check directly without having to, in a, in 7 it will follow from the Ronsky end, but in 8, in 8 and 9 you should directly prove the linear independence without attempting to compute the Ronskyian. In 8 particularly, do not make any attempt at computing the Ronskyian. That is not a good idea. Directly check. You will have to go a little beyond because assume that there is a linear combination which is 0. Then, then knock out the exponential, then you, you are left with a polynomial equation, right. And that will, that will be true for all values of x, right. But a non-zero polynomial cannot have infinitely many roots. So, all the coefficients are 0 you have to use that principle. And what about 9? What about 9? Suppose I put log x equal to t, okay, and then and suppose I put log x equal to t, then I again I get back to the same one, right. So, I think you are getting the idea generally. So, please do these exercises, they are very important. Okay, now, let us proceed further. Now, we want to solve the inhomogeneous equation, correct. Now, suppose y1 and y2 are two linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation y double prime plus p x y prime plus q x y equal to 0. That is your given 
a basis of solutions for the homogeneous equation. Question is how do you find a particular solution of the uh, of the inhomogeneous equation y double prime plus p x y prime plus q x y equal to r x. That is the next problem that we are that we are going to uh, that we are going to be concerned with. Well, if y 1 and y 2 are linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation and if you know one particular solution, any one particular solution y p, then what do you do? You take the general solution of the homogeneous equation c 1 y 1 plus c 2 y 2 and then add to it the particular solution. So, the and to get the general solution of the inhomogeneous equation. So, the most general solution of the inhomogeneous equation consists of two pieces namely the complementary function which is c 1 y 1 plus c 2 y 2 and a particular integral namely any one known solution of the inhomogeneous equation. You do the same thing in linear algebra also right. You take you when you want to solve a x equal to b what do you do? You take the full solution of a x equal to 0 correct and then to add to it the one particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation. The, the, the principle that uh, the, the same principle applies here also. Is it clear? So, now the question is that how do you find the particular integral? Right. So, now uh, we will proceed to this problem and the method is known as the method of variation of parameters. This is called the method of variation of parameters. You are probably familiar with this method of variation of parameters. Nevertheless, I am going to discuss it here. Have you seen this method of variation of parameters? You have taught this also several times to students, right? Okay. So, uh, let us look at the method carefully and let us ask some fundamental questions about the method. So, the particular solution y p of the inhomogeneous equation y double prime plus p x y prime plus q x y equal to r x is sought in the form y p equal to v 1 y 1 plus v 2 y 2 where v 1 and v 2 are functions of x correct. Item number 1 this has been named as equation 1. This is the form of the particular solution correct. This is an ansatz. You are making a formulation. You are saying you are postulating that the particular solution is of this form. So, let us call this an ansatz formulation. So, you are assuming that the form of the particular solution is exact uh, is of this form. Okay. And then what do you do? You differentiate it. You get four terms correct v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 plus v 1 y 1 prime plus v 2 y 2 prime. What do you do now? Do you recall? You set the first two terms uh, sum of the first two terms equal to 0 correct. All right. So, now we make the second ansatz v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 equal to 0 correct. Is this do you recall this? Now, so that means that y p prime will be out of the four terms to sum of two terms are gone. So, now two terms are left and those and those two terms are here displayed. Now, you differentiate it again v y p double prime is what? y p double prime is v 1 prime y 1 prime plus v 2 prime y 2 prime plus v 1 y 1 double prime plus v 2 y 2 double prime correct. So, now you have y p prime displayed there, y p double prime displayed there and what is y p? v 1 y 1 plus v 2 y 2 that also you have. And so, now what are you supposed to calculate? y p double prime plus p x y p prime 
plus q x y p. Okay. The first uh, y p double prime has four terms, p x y p prime has two terms, these two here and q x y p has these two terms over here. Correct? The whole thing, the whole thing has been written down and it has been arranged in column wise. So, what do you see? What is our basic assumption? Y 1 and Y 2 are solutions of the homogeneous equation. So, that what you see that th uh, the sum of the terms in the columns will be 0. This column, all the things that you see in this column, some of the terms that you see in this column will be 0, correct? Similarly, the sum of the terms that you see in this column will be 0, is that right? That is gone, so those two columns are gone and so you get you are getting y p double prime plus p x y p prime plus q x y p equals v 1 prime y 1 prime plus v 2 prime y 2 prime. But what is the left hand side? It is r x because y p is a solution of the is a particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation, correct? y p is a solution of the inhomogeneous equation. So, what are we left with now? v 1 prime y 1 v 1 prime y 1 prime plus v 2 prime y 2 prime equal to r x. Okay. So, let us see. So, v 1 prime y 1 prime plus v 2 prime y 2 prime equal to r x. Now, we have a pair of equations. Remember what is our assumption? v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 equal to 0. We had, we had uh, made the second ansatz. And now we are now we are saying v1 prime y1 prime plus v2 prime y2 prime is rx. So now we have a nice pair of simultaneous equations for v1 prime and v2 prime, and we can solve them. Why is it that we can solve them uniquely? What is the determinant of these two equations 3 and 4? It is exactly the Ronskian, and the Ronskian is not going to be 0 because y1 and y2 are linearly independent. So, you can actually solve for v 1 prime and v 2 prime and you integrate those, you get your v 1 and you get your v 2 and then your y p has v 1 y 1 plus v 2 y 2 has been found, correct. So, now let us look at this method in totality, we have made two fundamental assumptions the two ansatz. What are the first ansatz? That the particular solution y p has the form v 1 y 1 plus v 2 y 2, where v 1 and v 2 are functions of x. And the second ansatz is this, v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 equal to 0. Correct. These two things have to be noted. We have made two basic assumptions. What is the rationale behind this? How did how does it occur to one that you should look for a particular solution in the form v1 y1 plus v2 y2? And why should you make this assumption v1 prime y1 plus v2 prime y2 equal to 0? simply because Lagrange was very smart and he simply thought about it and hit upon this method and everything works. Of course, Lagrange was certainly very smart, but that explanation is not very satisfying, right? One should look for a, there must be deeper reasons why this kind of a uh, technique should work, yeah? Ha, huh, but then there is no, no longer a vector space business, you are when you take linear combination with functions, you are leaving the domain of a vector space. We will give you nothing, we will only give you the mm -hmm. right. So, what is the real reason? It works, method works, but that is again is not a very good explanation. 
Suppose if you did not know this method at all, would you have, ha, have hit upon this method? What is, there should be some way of understanding this, right? It is not just after seeing the method of course, <laughs> you know, okay, if you instead of constants, you look at functions of x and it works, of course it works. <laughs> but what about the second condition, v1 prime, y1 plus v2 prime, y2 equal to 0, where does that come from? That equation 3 is exceedingly puzzling. It is not very clear at all why that particular constraint is being put over here. So, these two assumptions are intriguing. It is not at all obvious where these things come from and one should probe deeper into this matter and think about this. And when you teach these things to your students, they are going to ask you these two questions and you have to have convincing answers, right. Okay. So, let us apply the method to a specific example. Solve y double prime plus y equal to 1, we will continue, we will come to that later. Solve y double prime plus y equal to 1, it is obvious that a particular solution is 1, y p equal to 1, that is pretty obvious. Just by inspection, you can see that the particular solution is 1. And the complementary function of course is c1 cos x plus c2 sin x. And so the total solution should be c1 cos x plus c2 sin x plus 1. So let us recover this obvious particular solution by applying the method of variation of parameters. Correct? Okay, so let us go and write down yp is v1 cos x plus v2 sin x, that is your y p. What is the, what is the ba uh, basic ansatz? v1 prime cos x plus v2 prime sin x equal to 0. And then what is the second equation? v1 prime y1 prime plus v2 prime y2 prime is r, correct? That is minus v1 prime sin x plus v2 prime cos x is 1. So, you have this pair of equations here. Solve them simultaneously. What do you get? V1 prime equal to minus sin x and V2 prime equal to cos x. Correct? And integrate it V1 equal to cos x and V2 equal to sin x. And so, what is your yp now? V, v1 cos x plus v2 sin x, v1 turns out to be cos x and v2 is also sin x. So, yp is cos squared x plus sin squared x which is 1. So, we have recovered the obvious particular integral via method of variation of parameters. Is that clear? So, the method works <laughs> indeed. <laughs> we will discuss those two uh, puzzling things later. Okay, those uh, the, the what is intriguing you, we will you will get the the solution to the puzzle in due course. Don't worry about it. Particular solution is not unique because I can add to the particular solution any complementary function. For example, one plus sin x is also a particular solution. One plus cos x is also a particular solution. In this example, y double prime plus y equal to one. Uh huh. No, yeah. The, yeah, except for yeah, except for add, addition of a complementary function, it is unique. There is two particular if you if y p uh, one and y p two are two particular solutions, that difference is a complementary function. If you take two particular solutions, the difference will be a complementary function. Exactly as it happens in linear algebra. If you take two solutions, a x one equal to b, a x two equal to b. If you take the difference, a times x one minus x two is zero. X one minus x two is the kernel of a. Same idea works. Okay? So, now having uh, aroused your curiosity as to why these two uh, things, why these two um, special assumptions. So, let us call it the geometrical interpretation for the method of variation of parameters. 
Note the two questions naturally present themselves. What is the motivation for seeking the particular integral y p in the form v 1 x y 1 x plus v 2 x y 2 x? What is the motivation for setting v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 equal to 0? Now, do not write I mean uh, all these things because there is too much of writing here. You just listen to this and then you will be this will be put up on the Moodle and you can read it ca casually. Next three slides there is too much material on the slides for you to write. So, you can just forget about writing because I will have to wait forever for you to finish writing. I mean this is. So, first of all we must note that the method of variation of parameters is due to Lagrange. Okay. And what was why was Lagrange interested in this problem? He was studying was he interested in developing a theory of linear differential equations? No. He was not at all interested in linear differential equations. He was interested in celestial mechanics. Specifically, he was interested in studying the motion of comets. And it was exactly in this connection that he developed this method. So, now what is the basic problem? You have a two body problem. For example, like the earth and the sun or sun and mercury for instance. So, what is the story behind this? You, you the planets revolve around the sun in elliptical orbits right. Now, you are trying to fix the ellipse in three dimensional space and you need five constants to fix the position of the ellipse. You need to describe the plane in which the ellipse lies that will be two constants right. The normal to the plane has to be specified then you need to fix the origin, then you need to fix the eccentricity. Right? There are five constants you need are needed to fix the ellipse in three dimensional space. These constants are called the elements of the orbit. In astronomy, they, they have very specific meanings these constants. Okay? So, that is the two body problem. So, when you solve the two body problem as a, uh, as a sun and a planet uh, consisting of a sun and a planet, the differential equation I am schematically representing as L y equal to 0. It is a non-linear system of differential equations. Right. And the general solution can be written down for the two body problem. You can completely integrate the two body problem fully and it will involve five constants. They are called the elements of the orbit. Correct. Now, what is the problem? Unfortunately, we are not just in a planet and sun uh, system. There are other disturbing uh, objects present. right? So, this two body system is being subjected to certain disturbing forces. The forcing function that you put is a disturbing function which is a periodic disturbing function. And specifically you can look at periodic comets like the Halley's comet and other comets which have elliptical orbits. And these, uh, these comets the uh, motion of these comets are being perturbed by for example, Jupiter and Saturn and other, other bodies. So, there is a disturbing function that is present. So, upon introducing a disturbing periodic uh, uh, function, a very weak disturbing function. The orbit is no longer going to be a fixed ellipse, but it turns out to be a precessing ellipse. Okay. It is a slowly, the, the ellipse is not, it is almost fixed, except that it is imperceptibly changes. So, the elements of the orbit C 1, C 2, C 3, C 4, C 5 are not constants, but they are slowly varying functions of time. And these constants vary very slowly. So, it is natural to look for a function, look for a solution of the form y of t comma c 1 of t comma c 2 of t comma c 3. That is why the posture, that is where this comes from that the constants are not constants anymore, but they are slowly varying functions of time. That is why the method is also known as the method of variation of constants. 
how can a constant vary really? So, the, there is a certain it is an oxymoron method of variation of constants. A constant by definition is a constant, you cannot vary it. But what is happening is that under a, uh, that the it is a slowly varying uh, functions of time that the ellipse is no longer a fixed ellipse, but it is a processing ellipse. A case in point is the orbit of Mercury. The orbit of Mercury, the uh, you see when you when uh, in the sun planet system, the point or the orbit which is closest to the sun is called the perihelion. Okay. Now the perihelion of Mercury is precessing at a certain rate. What is the rate of precession? It is 523 seconds of arc per century. Out of these, the astronomers were able to account for 480 seconds of arc because of the uh, influence of the other planets. They were not able to account for the remaining 43 seconds of arc per century. It was puzzling to the astronomers of the 19th century. It is the relativists that came to the rescue of these astronomers. It was Einstein who applied his theory of relativity to explain the residual precession of Mercury, Mercury's perihelion. And it agreed perfectly with his, uh, with his uh, discoveries. The 43, he exactly got 43 seconds of arc by applying the relativistic correction terms. So, it is really a slowly processing ellipse. So, they exist. So, that sort of explains from physical considerations where Lagrange got that idea of varying the constants. Right? The second ansatz v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 is 0, that is another story. Let us turn to that now. So, I already talked about the Mercury's perihelion precision. Now, let us turn to the second condition v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 equal to 0. Now, you are looking at a an, ob, uh, uh, an object that is moving under the uh, under some uh, uh, in accordance with some govern, uh, 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 law which will give you a homogeneous differential equation. Let us assume that you have a harmonic oscillator y double prime plus y equal to 0 and you are putting a disturbing function r x. You have put a disturbing function r x. Now, what do you think will happen? Suppose that suddenly at time x equal to psi, the disturbing function is shut off by some mechanism. Then what will happen to the trajectory? You have a trajectory y of x. right? Now, at time x equal to psi, you imagine that the disturbing function is suddenly shut off. Then what happens to the trajectory? Hmm? It will take a, the trajectory will be different of course, but it will be tangential to the original uh, to the original trajectory right it will move off in a different direction but at the point at that particular point x equal to psi it will move off tangentially it will not suddenly take a perpendicular direction is that correct okay so now let us assume that y of x is the actual trajectory and y of x capital y x psi is a fictitious trajectory which is a deviation of the actual trajectory for x bigger than psi. So, at, at x equal to psi, the two trajectories, the two points are the same and the tangents are also the same. The two curves have the same tangent, correct. So, that is so we get these two conditions y of psi little y of psi equal to capital y of x psi at x equal to psi that is this condition and the second condition is a tangency condition that the derivatives must be equal because you just told me from physical considerations you believe that the the fictitious trajectory should fly off tangentially so now these two conditions are there for you so now let us look at 
what these two conditions give you. Okay. For x bigger than or equal to psi, the absence of the forcing function implies that the trajectory moves according to the free oscillation, right? y double prime plus p x y prime plus q x y equal to 0, because at x, e, x greater than or equal to psi, the disturbing function is gone, it is no longer present. I am just, I told you that imagine a mechanism where the disturbing function is removed and we are trying to understand what is happening with the deviation. So, what will be the solution capital Y x psi? It will be a linear combination of y 1 and y 2, but the problem is the constant, its coefficients will be, will depend upon psi, the time at which the forcing function is cut off, correct. So, now you have the capital Y x psi is v 1 psi y 1 x plus v 2 psi y 2 of x, where v 1 and v 2 will depend upon the time at which the disturbing function is shut off. But now, what does the tangency condition give you? You differentiate y with respect to x and put x equal to psi. That should give you v 1 psi y 1 prime psi plus v 2 psi y 2 prime psi equal to y prime little y prime of psi. That is what you get. That is a tangency condition. But the points are also same. Na? Little y of psi should be equal to capital Y at x equal to psi. So, that gives you the second equation y psi equal to v 1 psi v y 1 psi plus v 2 psi y 2 psi. Now, look at these two equations. Now, they must hold for all values of psi, because we are imagining a sequence of fictitious, a whole family of fictitious trajectories. So, the idea is the actual trajectory is the envelope of the fictitious trajectories. So, imagine that for x equal to psi, the forcing function is cut off and you understand the trajectory beyond psi, because beyond psi there is no disturbing function and you can solve the differential equation. And then you have obtained a one parameter family of fictitious trajectory whose envelope is the actual trajectory. And that second condition is an enveloping condition, condition for the envelope. So, you take the second equation. So, you have these two pair of equations. Take the second equation, differentiate the second equation and subtract the first equation. What do you get? Look at these two equations, the last two equations displayed. Differentiate the second one and subtract the first one. What do you get? You get exactly the second answers that Lagrange made v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 is 0. Is it clear? So, that is exactly what it is. So, when you, you get exactly v 1 prime y 1 plus v 2 prime y 2 equal to 0, which is precisely the answers made by Lagrange. The actual trajectory is the envelope of fictitious trajectories. The actual trajectory is depicted in the green as a green curve and the fictitious trajectories are depicted as broken red curves. And for this reason, the method is also known as the method of osculating elements. Right? And uh, this particular description that I have given you, you can find in the paper that I wrote, a note on Lagrange's method of variation of parameters, which appeared in the Missouri Journal of Mathematical Sciences, volume 19, number 1, in the year 2007, pages 1 to 15. This description, this explanation for Lagrange's method of variation of parameters, I have not found in any book. It was exceedingly intriguing. So, now, have fun, you can have lots of fun. I must read for a long time <laughs> before it comes up. The next three pages are exercises, so please write down. The last part is very interesting. Three solutions of a second order o, uh, inhomogeneous OD are given and you have to find the general solution. Three solutions are given to you. The difference of any two of them is the solution of the homogeneous equation. 
yeah, the students will like the method of variation of parameters. It's very important because it also gives you um, a certain representation formulas for solutions. It applies to partial differential equations also. In the case of partial differential equation, it is more popularly known as Duhamel's principle. They don't call it method of variation of parameters. They call it Duhamel's principle. If you read Courant and uh, Hilbert's methods of mathematical physics, you will see the this Duhamel's principle. But it's basically method of variation of parameters applied to PDEs. Okay, I'll just write it on the on the on the next slide and put it. When the next slide goes up, I'll I'll put it. You're finished writing. Okay. Here is the next slide for you. So, in the context of PDEs, it is called a method of, uh, sorry, Duhamel's principle. Okay, and uh, a good reference for that is Courant Hilbert's Methods of Mathematical Physics, Volume One and Volume Two. Now, these two volumes are now available in Indian edition. So, if your library doesn't have it, please order it for your library. You can contact the Book World Enterprise. And it's a fantastic thing. It was out of print for a very long time. All books written by Courant are classics. He wrote a book called What is Mathematics? It's a must for every teacher of mathematics and for every student, every serious student. You must read this book, What is Mathematics? He wrote a book with Fritz John, Introduction to Calculus and Analysis, Volume 1, Volume 2. Copies are available in the Book World Enterprise in our campus bookstores. It's available in Indian edition. Get yourself a copy of it if you don't have it. Get your copies for your library if they don't have it. It's a fantastic book. I mean, if you really want to understand analysis and calculus, you must read Courant's, Courant and Fritz John. And Courant's Hilbert is also a, a very great classic, which is. So I suggest, I suggest uh, you buy, uh, you you try to acquire all the copies of uh, all books written by Courant and read them. Particularly if you're teaching engineering students, and I mean, he worked, uh, he worked in fluid dynamics, shock waves, and a variety of problems in mathematical physics. And a very great mathematician, right? And the last slide of this. Have you finished writing? No, you're slow. You're slowing down, and you have a long list of exercises to work out. Tutorial sheet, tutorial three. All these are part of tutorial three. In the morning, we did tutorial two. We took up some exercises from tutorial two, particularly the. Uh, the exercise on envelopes and uh, and uh, orthogonal trajectories. Which one? Ha! There are only three conditions. The fourth condition is not required. You have to use the abel liouville formula. You can't solve the differential equation. It's a Legendre's equation. You can't explicitly solve it. Hmm? You are all that I'm asking you is the Ronskin at half. So, the Ronskin at the origin you can compute and then you have to calculate, use the Abel Liouville formula and calculate the Ronskin at half. Quite a, a tricky thing, is not it? <laughs> so, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. No? So, Ronskin at 0 is 1. So, w, w x equal to w x naught x of e to the power minus integral, uh, sorry, x of in, minus integral x naught to x, uh, p x d x. What is p x in this case? Minus 2 x upon 1 minus x squared. That is your p x. Right, log of 1 minus x squared. That will be the integral, correct? Okay. okay, let's go to the next slide. And this completes second chapter. This completes the second chapter.